saying, hey, this is where the piston is, and that's your crank position sensors right here. Some of them use one, some of them use two, and that, what that does is it mounts on the outside of the flywheel, and the flywheel has a trigger pickup. You got a trigger pickup here, you got a trigger pickup right here on the very outside, and when that comes around that sensor, it creates a voltage, and that sends a signal back to the ECU, okay, this is where your crank is, so it knows when to squirt the fuel, but it also knows when it needs to spark, that's how it figures out its spark timing. Sometimes they'll use one of these for spark, and sometimes they'll use one of them for injectors. Every manufacturer does it a little bit differently. The fuel pump, we've got to build pressure to the injector. It's not like a carburetor where we can pretty much use vacuum to pull the fuel into the engine. The problem with an injector is if you're, if you're squirting fuel into the cylinder itself, that cylinder is under pressure. So you've got to have more pressure fuel to overcome the pressure in the cylinder. The E-Tech has 500 pounds of pressure when it, it, it builds 500 pounds of pressure at the injector itself. So that's overcoming the cylinder pressure to get the fuel in. Now the Articats is a little different because they're squirting fuel into the throttle body and it's atmospheric pressure basically. So they don't have to have near as much pressure. Same with the Polaris where they're injecting into the case, the case is under much less pressure. Uh, Articat, most of the systems run about 40 pounds of pressure. You'll see some that are down in the 38, I've seen some as high as 45. The Skidoo is totally different, but the Articat and the Polaris is for the most part are in the 40 pound range. Um, Variations in fuel pressure affect how much fuel is being delivered. So if, if guys are struggling with running issues, one of the troubleshooting procedures usually needs to be checking your fuel pressure against what the manufacturer recommends. Now some of the manufacturers have somewhat of a variance, they'll say 38 to 42 pounds. Others will say it has to be right here, 42 pounds. But the key there is, like I've got a, an F7 race sled and I've been fighting some, I've been troubleshooting. One of the first things I did was put a fuel pressure gauge on it and sure enough it was reading 41 and a half pounds which is right where it's supposed to be so I knew that wasn't it. And I actually went out and did a full throttle run to make sure that it didn't drop while I was doing my run so that the pump couldn't keep up with the flow. It was maintaining 41 pounds. So that's where the fuel pump comes in. You'll see there's a pickup here and a pickup here. There's a strainer on the bottom, acts basically like a fuel filter. And then there's a return line which goes back to the pressure gauge that dumps any fuel to keep to maintain the pressure at 41 pounds. Same with, or that's the Polaris and then the Cat's pretty much the same way. Articat uses a little bit different system. They've got a, uh, a pressure regulator right here, unlike Polaris. Polaris does it a couple different ways. Okay, we talked about throttle positioning sensor or TPS when we were looking at those throttle bodies on the first slide. That's a Polaris throttle positioning sensor mounted on the side of the throttle body. This is an Articat. Basically the same unit. They're basically calibrated the same way. It's a zero to five volt sensor. They pipe five volts to it and they, they pipe less than five volts back. As the throttle valve changes in its position, it varies the voltage going back to the ECU. The ECU has a pre-programmed database with an assigned voltage to an assigned load, basically. So that's how they sense the load on the on the, or the, or the, the demand that the rider is putting for throttle is, is sensing load. There are three wire system, one's power, one's power in, one's power going out and ground. Okay, pressure sensors. This is uh, how the machine knows how much, how dense the air is basically that's coming into the engine. And that really, on a, on a naturally aspirated motor, we're talking about altitude change is what we're talking about. Sea level produces 14.7 pounds of pressure. The higher you go, the less pressure you have or the less air density there is. And so this sensor can sense that and it sends, again, a zero to five volt signal back to the ECU telling the ECU how much pressure there is so it knows how much fuel to adjust for altitude change. It's pretty much a linear rate as far as barometric pressure is concerned. This one's Polaris's version, this one's Articat's version. Now you'll notice Polaris has theirs on the air intake box. That's a, this is a Polaris Pro 800, a 2011. 600 is the same way, and this is the air intake duct that goes up to the hood right down to the air box. Articat's different. This is an ECU right here, and underneath the ECU is a little clear chamber with a tube coming off. That tube, most of you that have M-series M sleds, you know what I'm talking about. There's a tube coming off the ECU that goes down kind of into the front of the frame. 
The length of that tube is extremely critical. If you change it, it's going to change the reading that the ECU gets. If it becomes kinked, it is also going to change the reading. And I've had guys struggle with fuel compensation as they change in altitude and sometimes it comes back to a kink tube. I've had guys burn them, melt them. There's a number of things that can happen. So in your troubleshooting procedures, if you're ever trying to troubleshoot a fueling issue or a runnability issue, that tube should be checked. Okay? Air intake temperature. As air temperature rises or lowers, the air density changes as well. So it may act like a higher or lower altitude because of that air temperature's changing. So the manufacturers have an air temperature sensor. This is an Articat version. And this is a Polaris version. Wait a minute, we just pointed at that for barometric pressure, right? So what this is called is a T-map. It measures barometric pressure and temperature. It's a four-wire sensor, where this is a two-wire sensor for temperature. So Polaris and Articat do it a little bit differently. Skidoo, I'm not as familiar with the E-Tech system, so I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not exactly sure how they're setting theirs up. I, I'm gonna do some more research on that this summer. I think they're also using this style here because it is a Bosch system. Okay, but I need to do some research on that. So that's the differences here. We just have a temperature sensor where here we have a T-map, and one of those wires is sending a voltage back to the ECU, which represents a temperature, okay? Exhaust probes. One of the biggest misconceptions on the late model snowmobiles is, well, how does my O2 sensor in my pipe work? Well, that's not an O2 sensor, or that's not an air-fuel ratio sensor. That is a a thermos or a thermal couple. It's a, it's it's a temperature sensor, and they're measuring pipe center section. Skidoo's doing it in the silencer here. Skidoo mountain models also have it in the pipes. Skidoo runs two on the mountain models on their short tracks. They run one just in the silencer. Articat runs one in the center of the pipe, just like Polaris does. The reason this is critical, what they're doing with this, Polaris can actually trim timing and fueling based off what the input of this sensor is. Articat, to my knowledge, only trims timing. Skidoo, I don't know. Again, it's a new system and I'm not as familiar with it. Why would you want to do that based off of pipe temperature? Well, <laughs> one of the, the characteristics that a true stroke can have is if the pipe doesn't warm up, if the, if the temperature inside that pipe is not warm enough, uh, they don't make the power they're supposed to make. The way a two-stroke pipe works is there's a harmonic wave that travels to the pipe and bounces back. When it bounces back, what they're doing is they're trying to hold unburned fuel and air in the cylinder. So that pressure going back and forth, back and forth, that's holding the unburned air and fuel in the cylinder until the piston comes up and closes the, the port. Okay, And then when the piston comes back down, the charge happens again, pushes a pressure in, the shape of the pipe pushes it back. The reason we care about the temperature is because the speed of sound is directly relative to temperature. And so that pressure wave is going to speed up or slow down based off of how fast or what the temperature of, of that, that pressure is. So by monitoring the temperature, they can try to keep the pipe working as efficiently as possible. And they can actually trim fuel or trim timing to try to get the pipe temperature to come up. So it's like, if you add oxygen to a fire, you get it hotter. Well, you can do the same thing if you lean fuel out. You can get something higher, hotter. And the pipe, somewhat, so to speak, does kind of have a flame front that comes through it, and that temperature wave can change based off of how much fueling is in there. Everybody follow me on that? That, that kind of gets technical right there. Any questions about that? So what, one of the side effects of a, low, of a temperature, or a pipe that's a low temperature, is they get a, what we call surging. And for lack of a better explanation, if you, if you go 100% throttle from a dead standstill and you hear your sled go wah, 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 that's a cold pipe. That's typically what they call cold pipe syndrome or surging. And so the OEMs have figured out how to monitor the temperature of the pipe, pull fuel, pull timing, do whatever they've got to do to try to get that temperature to build quicker and eliminate cold pipe. Um, I have guys ask me all the time, well, I'm just, I just take it out of the pipe. Well, that automatically tells the ECU that your pipe is cold. So it's going to pull fuel and pull timing the whole entire time you're riding it. And it is going to cost you horsepower and performance. So these sensors, they're there for a reason they need to be left in. 
Skidoo, I think, is basically doing the same thing, only they're just measuring it in a certain place. Now, you'll notice that certain manufacturers, almost every manufacturer uses a clamshell on the pipe. They wrap the pipe with an insulation and then they put a coating over top of it. They're trying to hold the heat in the pipe. And they're also trying to get the, keep the heat from expanding out into the chassis and, and heat soaking the chassis. You'll notice with a lot of aftermarket pipes, there's no heat shield and there's no insulation. What we've done there is you can design a pipe with shapes and cone lengths and diameters and whatnot to hold more heat or less heat. But we can also use ceramic coating to hold that heat as well. So there's different ways to get the pipe to warm up to a certain temperature and to maintain that temperature for optimal running conditions. You'll notice on our 2011 and 2012 Polaris pipe, we have actually installed a half shield, so to speak. It's not nearly as big as the stock one, but it's there. That's because when you're limited with room on what you can do with your pipe shape and your length, if you can't build the pipe to do what you want, then we had to go back to a heat shield to make that pipe maintain that temperature and to get it up to temperature quicker. So you'll, that's why we did it on that particular pipe and we don't necessarily do it on all the other ones. So each instance is a little bit different. Some chassis have more room to shape and do the pipe the way you want it and others don't. Any questions on that? Okay. Detonation sensor. This is another I would say misunderstood sensor. Detonation is, for lack of a better term, pre-ignition in the cylinder. It's, it's a combustion process that's happening when it's not supposed to. Ideally, we want the spark plug to control when we get combustion. If combustion happens too soon, the piston is still coming up, you get a combustion, it tries to push the piston down, but the piston can't go down, it's still coming up. Something has to give at that point, and it's typically damage to the engine. It builds heat very, very fast when that happens. Parts start to expand and rub together when they're not supposed to, or the piston just begins to deteriorate. A lot of times you can see what detonation looks like by little teeny tiny pits in the top of the piston. Or if you've got a piston with a significant amount of carbon, the carbon will begin to flake away. It literally beats the carbon off of the piston. It'll clean a piston, so to speak. Um, one of the ways we can tune right to the very edge is we'll do what's called a piston wash check. We'll take the spark plugs out, we'll shine a little teeny hole down in, we'll run the piston to the bottom, we'll, light, we'll watch the, what the top of the piston looks like. If you're not getting detonation, you'll have a nice amount of wash, probably about the size of your thumb, on both the intake port sides of the piston. Should have brought a piston up so I could show you guys. I've got one down at the booth, so I'll come look at it when we're done. If you're experiencing detonation, that piston will, will not necessarily show wash, but it'll show an area where either there's pitting, like sandblasting, or you'll be able to just see a nice clean piston where there used to be some carbon, but not so much anymore. That's the first signs of detonation. The next signs of detonation are a pretty big hole in the top of the piston, and it happens really fast. When I say really fast, I mean like that fast. I've had motors where I've detonated them just a little bit and, I've sh and, I, and I was doing a test run. So let, let's say I'll do a quarter mile test run first and I'll shut it down at wide open throttle, pull the plugs, oh yep, I got a little bit of detonation. But I didn't hurt the motor, it just started to flake the carbon a little bit. If I'd have done a half mile run, I wouldn't have made it to full half mile. So that's why when we do our testing, we start out quarter mile, half mile, mile. One, if I can run a full mile wide open throttle, typically I can run three, four, five minutes, whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay, so the reason I explain detonation to you is because when detonation occurs, it makes a sound, it makes a harmonic wave or a harmonic frequency. Because of the aluminum parts around it, they're going to absorb that harmonic frequency. This sensor is somewhat of a microphone, so to speak. It, it, can, it can measure those harmonic frequencies or that detonation. The more, and, and what they do is, is they pro, is the sensor will pick, turn it into a voltage. It'll pick it up and turn it into a voltage. So the, the higher the voltage, the, the higher the harmonic frequency, basically. No, lower voltage. Uh, well. On these systems, I think the lower the voltage, the higher the harmonic frequency. So essentially, the stronger the detonation. And they can program the ECU to, to trigger to watch a certain amount of voltage or a certain amount of detonation. So each manufacturer can say, all right, we want to set the threshold here so that we can, we can maybe see a little bit of detonation. That's okay, we're still safe. But as soon as we get to here, 
we're going to start retarding timing, we're going to start adding fuel, or we're going to put it into a limp mode and shut the whole engine down to 6,000 RPM. Each manufacturer does it a little bit differently. Some are called a soft, a soft stop, some of them are called a hard stop. Skew and Polaris both have a hard stop. 